If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. If, um, I would encourage you, if we haven't met, come on up after the service. I certainly would love to meet you and welcome you and your family here to the church today. You guys okay if I come in a little hot this morning? We'll just jump right into it. You know, I couldn't help but think as we're singing some of those songs and, and uh, thinking about the context of what we're witnessing in our country today with Christianity in particular, because I believe that we need to set the stage for culture, that culture shouldn't set the stage for us. Amen? Right? Do we actually believe the stuff that we're singing up there? That wasn't a resounding yes. I don't know about that, right? Like, you know, this is how I fight my battles is one of the songs that we sang. Another one, we serve a God of miracles, right? But do you expect miracles to break loose when you come out? I mean, is that really part of your expectation? Or should it be, maybe? Maybe in American Christianity, we have abandoned some of those thoughts and we focused on the things in the natural because when you open up the book of Nehemiah, as I did year after year for 20 plus years, I focused on the building of a wall. Doesn't sound that intriguing right off the get-go, right? Man, it's this historical story about this dude named Nehemiah who God used somewhat miraculously to leverage a group of people who were beat up, who were worried, who were nervous, who were just getting back to the city of Jerusalem and trying to rebuild it. He gets them to build this wall in 52 days, right? It's amazing, and I want to draw some context to his day and to ours, and I'm not making any political statements when I'm here saying this today, although there were political ramifications in Nehemiah's day, even as people in politics like to fight about things in our own day and age. I'm here to talk about spiritual things, not political things. Are you guys okay with that? But isn't it funny in our own generation over the past few years, there's been so much fighting over a wall being built on our southern border, right? They want to make a very big deal about it, right? Well, I attest to you today that it's not a spirit, or not a natural thing that we're talking about here, but when a country doesn't have borders, when a country doesn't have proper defenses, when a country doesn't have proper walls, guess what? It will not be a country too long. It'll be overrun by its enemies, right? And when you look at Nehemiah, I mean, again, I'm not making political statements here. When you look at Nehemiah, there were enemies in the natural that were attempting to overtake them. And this wall was very important to them for the protection in those days. The walls don't provide the same measure of protection for us in our days because we have things like airplanes and missiles that can overcome them, right? But we sang this song earlier and it said, I'm surrounded, right? The God who fights our battles. What I'm here to attest to you today is the wall was not so much a physical wall, but a spiritual hedge of protection that was surrounding the city of Jerusalem. It was a hedge of protection that was being built. It was a hedge of protection that was going up. There was something going on in the lives of the people and the enemies were there bringing opposition against it, trying to stop it from happening, right? In our day and age, we might find ourselves at a little bit of a different place where maybe in our country today, the walls are actually coming down. That spiritual wall of protection is coming down and we need to do something about it. The enemies are overtaking us. We see it abound and I'll make the case for it today. But I'm also here to say today that we need a spiritual hedge of protection around us, around you and me as believers in Jesus Christ. If we're to function in this society that we live in today, we need a hedge of protection around us. We need our God to fight our battles on our behalf. And there's some things that scripture tells us that when we do certain things, guess what? God will come to our defense, that God will be there for us. When we live and act and behave in certain ways, it opens up the door for supernatural spiritual activity because the real war is in the heavens and it manifests itself here on earth. Do you believe that from what we've been talking about a lot, right? that the powers and principalities are set against you. And I'm here today to issue an eviction notice to the powers and principalities that are set against you in this place today. The demonic powers and principalities that are trying to hold us back, they cannot do so anymore. You cannot stand demons in the face of Jesus. It says, we will overcome him by the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of our testimony. God will deliver you 
if you will seek him as the people in Jerusalem in that day sought him. Father, we come before you in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Lord, you are the God who fights our battles. You are the God of miracles. And as we study these scriptures today, may we not just see them with natural eyes. Yes, how beautiful it is that a wall was going up. But guess what? That wall barely exists today. Lord, natural things will come and go. It's the spiritual things which endure. And today, would we see clearly what you're trying to speak to us? Would we be able to apply it in our lives and would be able to walk in power in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. As I began to pray and look at this message, I went in a very different direction than I originally thought it would go, but I genuinely believe it's for such a time as this. The first verse, oddly enough, to come to mind for me was 1 Chronicles 12, 32. It said, Of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And then God is seeking out men and women like those in that day who understood the times that they found themselves in and knew what to do. The times that we're in are confusing. The times that we're in are dangerous. May God give us the wisdom and understanding to discern them and know what to do. You see, Nehemiah, if you'll recall from a couple weeks ago, He heard this story of his people who were in peril. It wrenched his heart. He sought God through prayer and fasting, and God told him what to do, right? He executed on the plan that God had put in his heart, and we're still talking about what God did through him, even unto our own generation. He was a man like those in Issachar's day that knew the times and knew the seasons and was willing and able and stepped into that. I'm looking for Christians to step into the gap in our generation to get out there and make a difference in the face of the monumental demonic powers and principalities that are set against us. Do you know your assignment? Do you know what you're called to do? If not, may we be like Nehemiah and seek him in prayer and fasting until he reveals it because I assure you he has something he wants you to do. He doesn't want you to sit back and just go to church as we've been doing for so long. No, he wants you to be the church out there in the community. He wants you to not walk with words of earthly wisdom but with demonstrations of the power of God. As we gaze upon the challenges in our city, in our country, in our world, and what we're facing in this very moment, I believe God is calling us as believers in our generation, a very key word for today, to make a difference. So what was Nehemiah facing? What opposition was he against? How did he respond? This is what we're studying in the book of Nehemiah. One of the things that really began to came light, if you read the Bible, I've been going through a one-year Bible plan, and if you read it consistently, one of the things that really keeps coming to mind is there would be a generation that would repent, they would seek after God, they would go after him with all of their heart, and God would move and amazing things would begin to happen. It would seem that you'd get like one generation removed from that. They witnessed a lot of it and they would be still on fire for God. They'd still be seeking after him. And then you get to like the next generation, and it slips a little bit more, and then you get to the next generation, and it slips a little bit more, and then God would have to bring judgment upon them. So at the time leading into the book of Ezra and the time leading into the book of Nehemiah, it was a time where the Jewish people were under a season of judgment. They had been dispersed. Their enemies had overrun them. And now in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, they're coming back. There's a remnant that's saying, you are our God. Lord, would you forgive us? Lord, would you deliver us? Lord, we love you. Lord, we're going to seek you. They were coming back to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They had restored worship in the temple, but they were pioneers. They were forerunners. There wasn't even walls to protect them, yet they're coming back because they wanted to worship their God in spirit and in truth, right? So there's these cycles that would seemingly happen that continue on into our own generation. As the sons and daughters of Issachar, I wonder what generation that we're in right now. Are we in one where there's a bit of a falling away and a judgment coming? Or are we in a day of revival? Part of the choice has to do with what the remnant does. 
with the people who are believers in Jesus Christ, how do they act? How do they react during this season when judgment is upon a nation? One generation would follow hard after God. Another generation would fall away. At some point, God's people would cry out. They would cry out and it says God would hear their cry and he would come to their rescue. Would we be a people who would cry out in our own generation? Time and time again in the Bible, they would cry out and he would raise up a leader. That leader would help them. That leader would lead them into the promised land, so to speak. There were people like Moses. There were people like Ezra. There were people like Nehemiah. There were people like John the Baptist. People who God would raise up in their generation to make a difference. Leading into the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, it was a bad season until they came onto the scene. The Jewish people had gone so far as to sacrifice their own children unto the God of Molech. Isaiah warns them in Isaiah 17, 10, for you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. They would enter into a season of judgment, of God judging their sins. Yet in Ezra's day and Nehemiah's day, things would begin to turn around. We would read this story of a physical wall going up that was also a spiritual hedge of protection. Nehemiah 4.1 says this, there was opposition to that rebuilding. There was opposition to people being freed. There was opposition to people getting better. It said, now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and in the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on the wall, he will break down their stone wall. See, whenever you try to come out of bondage, whenever you try to come out of whatever's enslaving you, whenever you try to do something good for God, whenever you try to get ahead, don't you hear the voice of the enemy coming around and saying, you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to make it. Whatever you build is not going to be enough. Our God's better than your God, but thanks be to God, we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who set the stars into the sky. That's who we serve. No enemy can stand against us if we are after God's heart and doing the things of the kingdom of God. As you read through Nehemiah, you'll see that they continually tried to halt the rebuilding of the wall with various tactics. They would lie about them and his intentions to the king. They would use physical attacks and more. Whenever someone's approaching freedom, remind yourself of this. The devil will try to re-enslave you. You got that. Opposition will come against you. But listen to what scripture says in Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things if God is for us? Some of y'all know that verse? Some of y'all got that written on your refrigerator, don't you? (laughs) If God is for you, who can be against you? So as we seek to discern the times, as we seek to discern the day and age in which Nehemiah lived in when they were returning to the one true God, they were renouncing their sin, They were turning away from the gods of their age. What's happening in our own generation? Let me take you back to our previous series on spiritual warfare for just a second. Historically, there have been certain very powerful demonic powers that have controlled territories and regions and people groups. It's true. If you read scripture, you'll find this. You see it in the book of Daniel. You see it in many other places. There's powerful demonic powers and principalities over certain regions. Um, They have been defined throughout the ages in various ways. You see them. We, We look at these demonic powers and principalities, and because they have these supernatural powers, we call them gods. Little g, gods. They are real, yet they are still under submission to the one true God, the big G God, right? 
So these are real. People throughout the generations have worshipped them. Think of Greek mythology and Roman mythology as we call it. They worship gods like Thor or Zeus or Poseidon, the god of the oceans, or Aphrodite, the goddess of sex. I wonder if these demons that they were flowing in back in the day have any relevance in our own generation today. Do you think they might? I wonder if those same demons are the same ones that are wreaking havoc in our own generation. We maybe poke fun of them and don't call them gods or idols in our generation anymore, but we memorialize them in things like DC and Marvel Comics, do we not? We have the same ones. They're up there on the round table, and there's the one guy with the hand and the whatever. Somebody, who is that guy? He's Thanos. There you go. That's the one I was looking for, right? <laughs> So we turn them into comic books. The devil wants us to make light of these gods. But what if they're real demonic powers and principalities masquerading as comics, but have been there through the generations trying to enslave all of humanity? So I talked about how the Jewish people would even sacrifice their own children unto God. They would sacrifice to the God of Molech or also called Baal. And they were judged for that, right? So that's the kind of season that they were coming out of before Ezra and Nehemiah enter onto the scene and they begin to repent of those behaviors. So let's bring it fast forward for just a second. If you want to take abortion lightly, They sacrificed their thousands and were judged. We've sacrificed our millions and you think we're not going to be judged? You can call it whatever you want, a woman's right to choose or you name it or whatever, but I'm telling you, that's not how God sees it. I can tell you that right now. Am I here to judge you if you've made that decision? Absolutely not. I'm here to say that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Your sin might be different than my sin. My demons might be different than your demons. All of us need deliverance. All of us need help. All of us need hope. All of us need forgiveness. But when a society gets to the place where that kind of stuff is okay, let me tell you, demonic powers and principalities are actually in control and not God's spirit because God's spirit brings life, right? God's spirit brings love. God's spirit brings hope. There's also demonic powers like Mammon, the god of money, or Jezebel, the seducing spirit. So I ask one more time, maybe a rhetorical question. Do these spirits of old still roam the earth today? I attest to you that they do. And these present real opposition to the work of God and they're real little g gods that we're fighting against today in our own generation. I think the United States of America follows some of the same patterns of the Jewish people and Jewish history, and really that pattern of all of history of cycles of generations, seasons of revival followed by seasons of deep darkness followed by seasons of revival. I find, I think we find ourselves at a season of great darkness right now, one where God's people really need to rise up. America was formed by the Puritans, right? Maybe they had issues. I assure you they did. There's no doubt those early founders had issues, right? We all do. But what did they go to escape? They came seeking religious freedom. They came seeking the freedom to worship the one true God when they came and founded this nation. That is undeniable evidence, right? They came. This nation was birthed with the hope that people could come here and worship God freely, How amazing is that? So take that as that first generation that sought hard after God like the Jewish people that said, hey, I'm coming here. I'm going to seek this place where I could worship the one true king. If you fast forward all the way to, say, 1960s, we'll, we'll do away with about 200 years of history, but let's jump all the way forward to the 1960s. The spiritual climate of America began to change. People began rejecting the faith of their fathers, and they began to open the door for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Did they not? Remember that season? Some of you who are old enough to remember it? 
Others of us were children of that. Some of you are like, what are you talking about, Eric? I have no clue what you're talking about, right? Which is absolutely okay. But I attest to you that they did. The free love movement, right, that they had in the late 60s quickly led to the original Roe versus Wade decision in the early 70s. It wasn't within 10 years of that, was it, right? So, okay, let's go out and have free love, go out and get pregnant, and then guess what? We have to have free abortion so that we can deal with that issue, that problem, that challenge, right? Doctrine of demons, I'm here to tell you right now. Doctrine of demons, right? So they open the door. I attest to you, the hedge of protection begins to come down. How do you know a hedge of protection begins to come down? Think of the Jewish people. Whenever they were straying from God, how many wars did they win during those seasons? I respect everybody in the military here today, but what war have we won since Vietnam? Not even Vietnam, right? As the spiritual climate of the nation began to go down, our nation has fought war after war and been in continuous war, literally, since Vietnam. Name one that we've won. I think the evidence is right there with one more. We'll keep adding to the evidence, okay? We'll, we'll keep adding to it. I'll keep building this case. The walls literally fell down on 9-11. Did they not? The hedge of protection over our nation literally fell down, right? Thinking about that, God led me to a very strange verse. We've always used this, or I have, in the context of an individual. Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through a waterless place seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return home to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. The last state of that person is worse than the first. We generally end there, but look at that next sentence. What does that next sentence say? So also will it be with this evil what? It's not just about an individual. This, whoa, I'm getting goosebumps. It's getting serious up in here right now. Let's take the individual case. God delivers you from alcoholism and drug addiction, right? You've swept the house clean. You're spiritually working it, man. You're doing good. You're going after it. You're keeping spiritually fit. The demons start to come knocking at your door. One drink won't hurt. One drink ain't going to hurt you. Weed, man, that stuff's legal now. You can go smoke it. It ain't no problem. You take it. I mean, it is as if you never quit. That demon will come back seven times seven. Your state will be worse than the first. Ask any addict who's gone back and relapsed. I'm here to tell you that that is the absolute truth, right? Thus, I even say for all you people who have the liberty to go out and drink out there, just remember that it's called spirits for a reason. You get mad at me, I don't care. I'm old. I ask you to analyze it on your own. If you want to dabble with that after you know, that's all on you. But what about a generation that does it? Oh, my goodness. What happens when the 60s hippies start a movement of free love, free sex, free drugs? Where does that lead 50 years later? Do we not have an opiate epidemic right now where people are dropping dead like flies? Do you think seven times seven demonic activity maybe is being released into our midst? Why are we wondering why things are getting so jacked up and so bad so quick right now? The hedge of protection has been removed. Let's go back and name some of those demons just a, a, a bit for a moment. And you tell me whether you think they are at work again in our nation. How about that one demon that they called in Roman or Greek culture Aphrodite? the goddess of love, combined maybe with a little bit of Jezebel up in there. Free love has led to the spirit of pornographia affecting our men, our women, our relationships in our day. 
Mary, even secular people are starting to realize that Mary Jo was citing some statistics to me earlier, like 60% of men are in jacked up stuff because they're into pornography. What does that also lead to? That leads to things like abortion, does it not? So do you think the God Molech is still being worshipped even though you don't do it as an act of worship, but when you show up to that abortion clinic, do you not think Molech is getting all the glory for every single child that is sacrificed in our generation and we call it an act like it's nothing? I'm here to tell you. And then you got people, you want to know doctrines of demons, go to Romans chapter 1 when it cites all the different things that people do and then it gets to the next stage of it and it says, then there will be people who not only practice these things but encourage others to do so as well. And then he says, when your nation or your people gets to that place, boy, you are really jacked up. When you got people crying and chanting, oh, abortion is so good. Yes, this is so good. Roe is way terrible. How could you remove this right? How could you do this? La, 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 la. They're losing their minds. Have you not seen it on TV? Yeah. When you are championing things that are against God, let me tell you, the demons have been released into our own generation and we're wondering why our kids are suffering. We talked about pharmacia, we talked about drug addiction, we talked about the thousands who are dying in our own generation because we released that demon back out into the wild. How about mammon? Mammon is being destroyed before our very eyes right now, the God of money. How do y'all like all that inflation that's going on right now? Y'all up and cheering? Y'all excited about that right now? Y'all loving your gas bill, your electric bill? You're loving how your politicians love you so much that they would just inflate everything away so that you have no money in your bank account and you can barely make it? The God of mammon, the God of money. How about even the whole stuff that we're witnessing with gender identity, all the stuff that we're witnessing with gay marriage and, and, and same-sex attraction? Do you think that's on accident? No. Genesis 1:27. so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. An attack against the very image of the image bearers of God. If he can confuse our identity, then guess what? He's saying that we're no longer God. So why do you think the demons are going after all of these things? So aggressively, I'm here to tell you, I believe... Maybe you don't believe the seven times seven has been released in our generation because of what we've done. We've allowed the hedge of protection to drop. The opposition momentarily is winning. But how do we get it back? I'm not here to be all miserable. I'm here to say we can overcome. Weren't we singing some great songs just a little bit earlier? I'm here to tell you that things are in no way hopeless. Because when Jesus came onto the scene, guess what? Debauchery was at a peak at that particular moment too. He came in to turn the world right side up, not upside down. He came to bring life. He came to speak truth. He was truth. He was love. He embodied these things. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But what is the consequence of inaction? What's the consequence of us continuing on in our sin? We're believers. We need to set the pace. Romans 106, verse 20. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away from his wrath from destroying them. When we have more people going to watch college football, putting on all of these crazy stuff for pro football too, than we do got going to church on Sunday mornings. I ain't seen no churches in America with 90,000 people showing up on a Sunday. Then a nation has been overrun by demonic powers and principalities. Knowing opposition abounds, what are we to do? The nations before us, the people before us, they would repent and cry out. Lord, forgive me, forgive our people, forgive us for what we have done. Lord, 
We want to see things change. We don't want to see the people around us going to hell. We don't want to see these things continue on in our generation. Lord, would you make the change start with us? Would a remnant rise up in our own generation that would go out there and begin to make a difference, that would begin to pave the way, that would begin to rebuild the temple so that they could worship again, that would begin to rebuild the walls so that people would have a hedge of protection again, that we would be a safe haven in the midst of the chaos that surrounds us, that yes, you would be aliens and foreigners in this crazy place called America that we live in today that I barely recognize as it compares to when I was young. That's how much has changed in our generation. You talk to older people like my dad, and he'll say, Man, I've never seen it this crazy. I've never seen a day and age like this. He's right. It's crazy out there, but we can do something about it. What did they do in Nehemiah's day? I'm almost done. Nehemiah 9.1. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. They didn't receive, let's substitute the word foreigners for the idols of that day. They didn't receive the things that were going on and that the people of the world were receiving and accepting as truth and that everybody should be this way and everything should be accepted. And we need to um, accept that people can turn their identity into a cat. No, that's demonic, man. That's nuts. You young people are nuts, no, I'm teasing. Our generation's gone nuts. That's not normal. Why we accept that kind of stuff as normal is something's wrong, man. It's demonic powers and principalities that are at work convincing people that these things are normal, and it's not normal. God's word is true. Do you believe that today? God's word is true. Pray, repent, ask God to give us a hedge of protection. Why don't we close by doing that? Would you rise with me and bow your heads for just a moment? Job 1.10 says this. Have you not put a hedge of protection around him and his house that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. See, God can put a hedge of protection around an individual even as he does around a generation or a group of people like a country. Nehemiah 4, 9. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. The Lord is looking for watchmen to be on the walls. The Lord is looking for people who are willing to make a difference and go against the grain in our culture, in our generation, and stand up and say that it is not right, that these things are not normal that God has called us to something different, that the things of old are true in our generation. There's nothing new under the sun. These same demons that masqueraded as Thor and Zeus and Aphrodite are the same demons that are out there messing with people's heads today. And it keeps going on and it keeps continuing on until a remnant rises up and says, Lord, forgive me. And it starts with us. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray that the words that I spoke today have convicted your heart. I pray that if you're here today and you're a believer in